Hey folks, you know what icebergs are, you know what paintings are. Today we're gonna be looking at iceberg paintings. We got this painting, we got this painting. There are over 50 paintings in this video and I'll be telling you all about it. Uh, fair warning, things will get a little graphic in this video. Illustrative even. I'll be talking about unwholesome things like decomposing bodies and whatnot, which might not be your cup of tea, but if it is, then uh, hey, uh, grab a snack or something. And of course, don't forget to like and subscribe, but you don't need me to tell you that, do you? And here we go. The first painting on the first tier is Saturn devouring his son. Now, there's not a lot that hasn't been said about this painting already. If it's not the most popular painting in the world right now, it certainly is the most popular painting on YouTube. But I want to give my own spin on it. Saturn devouring his son is part of a series called Black Paintings. These paintings were painted directly on Goya's house wall when he was a little loony and a lot deaf. In Roman and Greek mythology, Saturn, or Cronus, was told a prophecy by his mother that one of his sons would overthrow him. So Saturn did what an old world parents would do and swallow his babies whole right after they were born. Until the sixth child, Jupiter, or Zeus, was hidden away from him and overthrew him a bit later. Now that's a fine and wholesome story and all, but the thing is, these black paintings were not meant to be seen by anyone other than Goya. So. He never named it, let alone mentioned. Goya also have this sketch way earlier depicting Saturn devouring his son, but it was also nameless and was not mentioned by Goya. And in the painting, the giant is not eating a baby, he's eating a headless, armless adult person. That's not mythologically accurate. So what if it's not Saturn? All right, let me tell you about this old English poem called Beowulf. It's one of the most popular and translated Old English literature. In it, the protagonist Beowulf fought a giant named Grendel, a descendant of Cain, the first murderer in the Bible. In the story, Grendel attacked the meat hall every night for 12 years straight because he hated fun. And the poem specifically said that he devours men he killed. One time he found a sleeping soldier and Grendel tore off his limbs before eating him. But here's the juicy part. The earliest and only known copy of Beowulf is from a thousand year old manuscript known as the Noel Codex. They didn't find it in any other text from that time period. And in the Noel Codex, the story right after Beowulf is the story of Judith, where she beheaded Holofernes. And guess what paintings on Goya's house is right next to Saturn devouring his son? Judith beheading Holofernes. So is this painting really Saturn devouring his son? Or is it Grendel eating a random dude? Who knows? The most important part is this painting was in Goya's dining room and that's a bit weird. The next painting is The Scream by Edward Munch. Now, Munch himself wrote a poem regarding his inspiration behind The Scream. I'm gonna read it out to you now. I was walking along the road with two friends. The sun was setting. Suddenly the sky turned blood red. I paused, feeling exhausted, and leaned on the fence. There was blood and tongues of fire above the blue-black fjord in the city. My friends walked on, and I stood there trembling with anxiety, and I sensed an infinite scream passing through nature. This poem was painted on the frame of a pastel version, and now that I've mentioned it, there are four versions in total. The first one is the 1893 painted version, which has a pento inscription on it, and it read, could only have been painted by a madman, and it's currently in the National Gallery of Norway in Oslo. At first I thought it was a critic or a visitor that wrote it, but a letter study showed that it was written by Munch himself after receiving critical comment in the exhibition of 1895. The second version is the pastel version, painted in the same year, and is currently in Munch Museum, also in Oslo. The next one is the second pastel version, this is the one with the poem written on it. It was painted in 1895 and is currently in a private collection of some CEO. And the last one is from 1910. It's a painted version. The 1893 and the 1910 version have been stolen in the past, but they're back now, so it's all good. The screen is one of the most influential paintings in history. If you don't believe me, just look around you. They're everywhere, from movie posters to the emojis we use. But the thing is, in the original painting, it's not the guy that's doing the screaming, it's everything around him. He's just covering his ears up to block him out. The Raft of Medusa by Theodore Jericho. The Medusa in this case isn't referred to the snake-headed lady. Rather, it tells a story of a shipwreck, a frigate named the Medusa. She was assigned to ferry some French officials to the port of St. Louis in Senegal. The captain appointed to the Medusa was Hugh de Roy de Chomerais. 
he hasn't sailed for 20 years, but because him and King Louis the 18th were bud buddies, uh, he got the job anyway, which as you can imagine went quite horribly. Uh, he was so lost during the expedition that one time he resorted to asking a passenger to help him navigate the ship. One person named Rickerford, and Rickerford was a philosopher. Now, philosophers are known to ask a lot of questions and not providing good answers. Worse yet, Rickerford had no qualification in ship guiding whatsoever. And what did you know it? The ship wrecked in the Bay of Orguin. There weren't enough lifeboats to carry all the passengers to shore and the ship was breaking up due to strong wind. So they put 146 men and one woman on a raft, initially constructed to hold cargo and tow them with the lifeboat. The raft was horribly unstable. You couldn't steer it or navigate it and half of it was underwater. The lifeboat people which included the captain and the governor, soon realized that uh, this was an impractical task. So they decided to cut the tow line, leaving everyone on the raft to the element. And the element was not kind on them. On the first night, 20 people were either killed or committed suicide. By the fourth day, only 67 people survived and they resorted to practicing custom of the sea. Uh, custom of the sea is just a nice way of saying you can eat your friends when push comes to shove, which is a great system in and of itself. This way you don't have to wait until you're deliriously hungry and start <laughs> your friends, you know? You can enjoy your pal slowly and not screw up your digestion. Remember kids, 30 chews until you swallow. In the end, there were only 15 survivors. Tons of prep work went into creating this painting. First, because it's huge, and it was gonna be shown in the Paris Salon of 1819, which was a huge deal for painters. Jericho interviewed some survivors of the raft. He went to Hospital Moore to sketch out some bodies there. He was really obsessed with the stiffness of the corpses for some reason. He even brought back several severed body parts to study their decay. Now, this is just my opinion, but for the cannibalism scene, he, he might even give them a little nibble, you know? Wouldn't surprise me. Jericho experimented with many sketches beforehand, figuring out which event his painting should portray. The cutting of the tow line, the rescue. In the end, he chose this moment when the survivors spotted the ship Argus and the horizon, while at the pinnacle of the painting, a black man as a protagonist holding the hand of another survivor signaling for help, which was almost unheard of at that time because Slavery wasn't officially abolished until 30 years after this painting's been made. In reality, the ship Argus didn't notice them and sailed right past, but they came back two hours later purely by chance and rescued the survivors, so everyone was alright. Well, except the ones that were eaten. Autumnal Cannibalism by Salvador Dali This was painted around the time the Spanish Civil War started. Let me talk about Spanish Civil War a bit because it's a subject of more paintings in this video. Here we go. Following World War I, Spanish politics were in shambles. In 1930, a dictator named Primo de Rivera decided to drop dead. Rivera was supported by the king, so the king was like, okay, that's a bit rough, but I'll just appoint another dictator. Turns out the next guy was kind of a buffoon, so he was like, I'm going to head out. So the next guy came in and said, we're going to have an election. The party that won were the Republicans, and they declared Spain's the Democratic Republic now. And the king now, without his pet dictator or military support, was like, I am going to head out. So Spain's democratic now. That's great, right? Social reforms, women's rights, freedoms of speech. Nope. Revolt time. Also during this time, greater autonomy was given to the local northern area called Catalonia and the Basque countries. These will come into place later, so keep those names in mind. Anyway, another election happened, and this time, right-wing conservative won. You know what that means. Revolt time. Then all the left-wing parties thought to themselves, if they're gonna win the next election, they're gonna have to unite under one front and they're gonna have to be popular. So they formed the Popular Front and they won the 1936 election. You know what that means. Revolt time. And this time it was huge. Over 300 strikes. Arsonists burned down 170 churches and 69 clubs. Right assassinated left. Left assassinated right, assassination left and right until all hell broke loose on 17th of July, 1936, only six months after the election. A rebel faction calling themselves the Nationalists staged a coup in Spanish Morocco, led by a dork named Francisco Franco, and uh, this guy was not very nice. The Republicans were supported by Soviet Russia, Mexico, and some other international volunteers. While well, the Nationalists were supported by Portugal, Italy, 
and that funny mustache man from Germany. And you know what that means. War crimes time. Republicans committed war crimes. Nationalists committed war crimes. Everybody committed war crimes. And after almost three years of ruthless, senseless killing, the nationalists waltz into Madrid unopposed and Franco's 36 years rules of horror began. The Francoist regime sought total repression of everybody they deemed enemy. Executions, genocide, human experimentations, you name it. What are we talking about again? Oh, all right, Salvador Dali. He supported Franco. They even hung out and uh, paint, probably. Despite him saying that autumnal cannibalism doesn't take sides and civil war is bad and that he's not a fascist. Well, get this, Dali himself said, and I'm going to read what he say. It's not very nice, mind you. He said that all the present trouble in the world is racial in origin and that the best solution agreed upon by all the white races is to reduce all the dark races to slavery. Now, is it just me or that sounds like something a racist would say? Dali also believed that he knew the war was coming before it happened, like with this painting, Soft Construction with the Boiled Beans, which he painted six months before the Spanish Civil War started. He claimed this picture is a premonition of the Civil War and that it was the evidence of the prophetic power of his subconscious mind. Which is uh, horseshit, by the way, he read Con the story. The Ugly Dutch. <laughs> The Ugly Duchess is a satirical painting by Quentin Matsis. Matsis was possibly influenced by an essay from around the same time called In Praise of Follies, which satirized old women who, and I quote, still play the coquet, cannot tear themselves away from their mirrors, and do not hesitate to exhibit their repulsive withered breasts. The painting shows a grotesque and wrinkled old lady holding a red flower which was a symbol for engagement or courting, meaning she's single and ready to mingle. She's wearing a headdress called an Escoffion. Now keep in mind that this painting was finished around 1513 and Escoffion went out of fashion for like a hundred years at this point, which tied to the painting's message. Old ladies who think they still got it. No, grandma, you cannot bang my classmate. He's 40 years younger than you. Leonardo da Vinci also had a similar drawing in his series, Grotesque Head which scholars believe Matsis sent the initial sketches of the ugly duchess to da Vinci, which inspired him to create his own. My guess is da Vinci saw the sketches and thought that this meme would go viral big time in the Renaissance art community, so he reposted it. The caricature also inspired John Tenniel's The Duchess in Alice in Wonderland. Hell, this one is part of a series of paintings by Hans Memling called Earthly Vanity and Divine Salvation. There are three panels in total with pictures painted on both sides, this is called a triptych, though they were sawn apart and now there are six individual panels. There are theories suggesting that there might be a missing fourth panel with two additional paintings. The painting we currently have includes vanity, or lust, represented with Eve. Is, is that a poodle? Death, also maybe represented with Eve, but you know, dead. But I don't see any dead poodle though, so that's good. The Latin text translated to... This is the end of man. I am like mud and I return to dust and ashes. Salvatore Mundi, and also because he has a crown on, this may also represent Christ in majesty. Coat of arms of the Loyano family who commissioned the piece. The family motto is no pain, no gain. <laughs> That's like a 15th century equivalent of a motivational Instagram bio. Memento Mori. The text is a verse from the Bible. For I know that my redeemer lives. And at the last, he shall stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall seek God. The yet in my flesh part can also be translated to without my flesh, which makes much more sense in my opinion. And lastly, hell. The text says, in inferno, nulla est redemptio. There is no redemption in hell. The Nightmare by Henry Fuseli. The creature sitting on a woman's chest is an incubus known to have intercourses with sleeping ladies. You'd think for a creature whose main goal is to get laid, they'd have a more optimized appearance for the task. You know, you gotta have a six pack at least. Maybe, you know, strong jawline. Not this, ah, situation going on, you know. There's also a horse in the painting. It's a little hard to see, though this was added later as the initial chalk sketches didn't include the horse. Or maybe it's a mare. 
a nightmare. <laughs> oh, that was so funny. That's not where the word nightmare came from, by the way. The painting may be inspired by Fuseli's waking dreams, which in those times they believed was related to a folklore. It said that people can be visited by horses or hags at night. But my favorite interpretation was that he's just horny. Okay, hear me out. A few years before he painted this, he met a woman named Anna Landholt in Zurich. She was his friend's niece, and he fell madly in love with her. And get this, in 1779, he wrote a letter to his friends, the girl's uncle, detailing the fantasies of what he would do to her. Now, I'm gonna read it out to you. Here we go. Last night, I had her in my bed. <laughs> Last night I had her in bed with me, toss my bedclothes, hugger mugger, <laughs> wound my hot and tight clasped hands about her, fused her body and soul together with my own, poured in her my spirit, breath and strength. Anyone who touches her now commits adultery and incest. She is mine and I am hers and have her I will. <laughs> okay, Casanova. Anna's father didn't approve of the marriage. <laughs> oh, and she didn't seem to love him anyway. It was pretty unrequited. And she soon married a family friend after. So the lady in the painting may be Anna Landholt, and the incubus is Fuseli himself. And the horse through the curtain is a horse through the curtain, if you catch my drift. A lot of innuendos in this painting. I mean, just look at the lady's face. Uh, Fuseli also loved drawing X-rated stuff in private, and many of his paintings are very uh, sensual. He also painted a portrait of Anna at the back of the Nightmares painting, which pretty much confirmed what this painting was about, even though Fuseli himself refused to comment on it. The Anguished Man. This one first popped out on YouTube in 2010. The owner said he inherited it from his grandma, who told him that it was painted with real blood, and allegedly, the painting is cursed. Ooh, oh, ghost. The channel that uploaded the original video still posts to this day. Uh, he even made a cool little paranormal investigation video for the painting. <laughs> I think it's super cute. They're just having a crack. Uh, besides, without that little video and story, who's ever gonna see the painting? And it's not a bad painting. Listen, I don't care who the painter is or was, but I hope he's having a good time knowing that his painting is being enjoyed by other people. I have no problem with it at all. Unless you make an Anguished Man NFT, in which case the Anguished Man is gonna be me. Death and the Miser by Hieronymus Bosch. A miser is someone who hoards wealth and spends as little money as possible. And this painting is represented with an usher who loans money to the poor and charge unfair interest rates, better known today as loan sharks. This was seen as a great sin and illegal in early Renaissance period, around 1500s when this was painted. Why you ask? Because the Bible said so. But the Bible is not a business book and giving out loans without interest, it's not a good business. I mean, what else are you gonna do? Not give loan? Well, too bad, because people back then, whether they're poor or well-off, could not physically survive without a loan at some point in their lives. So the church was like, okay, fine, you guys can keep it hush-hush with your pawnbrokers. Until 100 years later, when a stable loan policy was introduced. The painting showed the miser on his deathbed, as well as when he was young, and of course, angels and devils. The message is pretty clear, don't be greedy, Love Jesus instead. The painting was influenced by an illustration from a book called Ars Moriendi, or The Art of Dying Well. It served as a memento mori and to guide people into choosing a virtuous path rather than dwelling on earthly sinful pleasures. The meaning of the objects in the foreground, we have no idea. Art historians are still debating over that to this day. The theories range from the miser being a knight, to God being more useful than a knight, to there's a knight out of frame getting his ass clapped by the devil. Oh, that one was my analysis. Oh, let me know in the comment below what you think. The painting is believed to be a triptych. However, all the paintings from this set are divided and one is missing. These paintings include The Ship of Fools and Allegory of Gluttony and Lust, which was one painting divided into two, Death and the Miser, and The Wayfarer on the outside, and the missing centerpiece, which is a shame because 
it could have proven my theory about, you know, the devil and the night. If it's like having the garden of earthly delights without, you know, the garden of earthly delights itself. Guernica by Pablo Picasso. You remember that little history lesson we had earlier? Let's dive a little deeper. In early 1937, the map of Spain looked a little something like this. In March, Franco decided to halt his siege of Madrid to focus more effort on the northern part, which is home to the Basque country. And the largest city of Basque country is Bilbao, which is also the largest industrial center of Spain. So the Biscay campaign started and the first fight broke out in Durango, which the nationalists won. The survivor of around 1,000 fled to the north to a little town called Guernica. Population of around 7,000, it was considered a key part of the Basque national identity, a spiritual capital. It was also a strategic point that stood between the nationalists and Bilbao. So on the 26th of April, 1937, a market day where farmers would usually bring their stuff to sell in the town square where people would gather. The nationalists, with the help of Nazis, Luvath's Condor Legion and fascist Italian Aviazone Legionaria, Carpet bombed the whole town for two hours straight with 22 tons of ordnance, incendiary included. The number of civilian casualty is still disputed, but the numbers ranged from 150 to 1600. Prior to this event, Picasso was commissioned by the Spanish Republican government to create a mural for the 1937 Paris World Fair to raise awareness and funds for the war. He worked on the commission since January without much passion until he heard about the bombing of Guernica. He then focused on using the event as the subject matter. He worked on the painting for 35 days and the result is what we have here. The color used was black and white to create that photographic feel since black and white was still the norm back then. And this painting was supposed to have the immediacy of a photograph, like something you'd see in a newspaper. And when it was unveiled at the Paris World Fair, uh, they didn't like it that much. I, I can see why. To a bunch of government officials, this is probably too abstract for them. But as the painting went on a world tour, its popularity gradually increases. And now it's one of the most popular works by Picasso and considered by many to be the most powerful anti-war painting in history. To show you how powerful it is, in 2003, 66 years after it was painted, a tapestry of Guernica was on display at United Nations. During Colin Powell's speech in favor of war with Iraq, they had to cover Guernica up with blue curtains. <laughs> it's too powerful. It's too strong. There are a lot to talk about the painting itself, which I'm not going to. Every detail here symbolizes something. It's going to take me ages to explain everything. Plus, interpreting them yourself is much more fun, I think. Zizitsvav Bekshinsky. If you recognize that name, you already know why this guy's great. If you don't, you might have seen his art before, but didn't know the name of the artist. Bekshinsky was a Polish artist. He was the leading figure of contemporary Polish art. His earlier works are in photography and surreal art, but his best known works are his fantastic series and his later works. Despite his art being as dark and grim as it is, he said that some of his works are misunderstood. Some of them are meant to be optimistic, goofy even. But all in all, he didn't know what any of his painting meant and he was adamant in avoiding any concrete analysis of his paintings. He said, I don't want to say or convey anything. I just paint what comes to mind even dismissing anybody who tried to give his painting any interpretation. That's why he didn't name any of his art, and in 1977, he even destroyed a bunch of them in his backyard. H.R. Geiger, y'all know who this is, the artist who made any Aliens film after the first one remotely watchable, while giving some of you a raging boner, probably. What you might not know is that he designed a lot of things, an album cover for Debbie Harris, though he said he never heard her music before, two bars in Switzerland, though there was one earlier in Tokyo which he hated, one time he even designed the Batmobile for the Batman Forever film, which I think he modeled after Batman's chromosome. A really spoke words of his genius out of the box imagination. There's also a plant named after him, but what's funny is it, it looks like he was the one who designed the plant. The iceberg also included Judith beheading Hollow Furnace, but I have no idea which one the creator is referring to. There are like five of them. But all of them tell the same story from the book of Judith from the Old Testament. The story was about Judith, a widow who was pissed off at her countrymen for not trusting God during the siege of a city, the Bethulia. The man who knocked was an Assyrian general named Holofernes. So Judith went to Holofernes' camp with a trusty maid and they let her see him because she was smoking. Judith met Holofernes, she gained his trust, and on the fourth day she charmed him in the banquet, made him drink shit ton of wine, he fell asleep, and it's just smooth chopping from there. 
Moving on to the next tier, we have Isle of the Dead by Arnold Bucklin. His studio where he painted this picture were located near the English cemetery in Florence, Italy, hence all the cypress trees. It's also where he buried eight of his own children. One time he was visited by a lady named Maria Berna. She saw the unfinished painting and loved it so much, so Bucklin painted her a smaller version on a wooden panel. She asked if he could add a coffin and a woman in white in there, alluding to her husband who died years earlier. And this seems to be the right move because Bucklin added the coffin and the woman in white in the larger version he was working on. This painting turned out to be a banger, so Bucklin created six versions of it. Bucklin himself described the painting as a dream picture. It must produce such a stillness that one would be awed by a knock on the door. This painting was so popular in the 20th century that almost every home in Berlin had a copy of it. Salvador Dali and H.R. Geiger even created their own version as an homage. A lot of historical figures own it too, so here are some famous fews. The first one we have Sigmund Freud, perhaps one of the most famous crackheads in the world. Next up is Vladimir Lenin. Now, for a 150 year old guy, it looks pretty darn good. The last one is a painter and a fellow artist. A uh, guy by the name of Adolphus Hitler. Moving on, Dante and Virgil by William Adolf Bugaro. Apparently it's a common name. This painting shows Dante and his guide Virgil while they're on a hike in the eighth circle of hell meant for falsifiers and counterfeiters. They came across two people in an eternal fight, Capaccio and Gianni Schicchi. Capaccio was an alchemist and a heretic, while Schicchi was a fraud and claimed another man's inheritance. Now here's a little personal anecdote. While I was reading the Divine Comedy, I, th I thought it was supposed to be funny. So when the guy is getting his uh, ass stabbed by the devil's trident, I started bellowing out in laughter, uh, but after I finished and I went to lie down on my memory foam mattress, I thought back on it and, and turns out it, it was a horrible thing that guy went through. It makes you not want to go to hell. Just food for thought. Next one is The Death of Marat by Jacques-Louis David. Jean-Paul Marat was a journalist and a politician during the French Revolution. He was one of the icons of a political faction known as the Montagnard or the mountains. Now these people were radical. Not like cool, but like chopping off heads of anybody who opposed them. Marat had a newspaper called Friend of the People, and oh, it couldn't be more unfriendly. The newspaper was attributed as a factor leading up to the September massacre, whereby a bunch of funny fellas headed to their local prisons and killed thousands of prisoners who they thought were aristocrats imprisoned during the revolution out of fear uh, they might form a counter-revolution. Now, in reality, three quarters of the people killed were just common people like you and me. Your local pickpocketer or dog kicker or what have you. Women, children, priests, doesn't matter. Kill them all, said Marat. So, as you can imagine, some people don't care much for this kind of behavior. One lady named Charlotte Corday was one of these people. So she tricked Marat into letting her in his house, and while he was taking a bubble bath, she, uh, Stabbed him to death. She was guillotined a few days later though. You might think this is where the terror went, but nope. In come Jacques-Louis David, a good friend of Marat by the way, with his beautiful paintings, raised Marat to the status of martyr. Now keep in mind that Marat suffered a skin disease that left him rotten with scabs and heavily confined to his bathtub. But look at this painting. David even put a beauty filter on him. And the note says, Given that I am unhappy, I have a right to your help. The reign after Marat's death was so terrifying. You know what they call it? The reign of terror. So yeah, painting can be pretty influential. Flaying of Marcius by Tiziano Vecellio, better known as Titian. Marcius was a satyr, a uh, nature spirit in Greek mythology, most commonly portrayed as a human with horse's ear, tails, and legs. They're kind of funny and bestial looking, Though as time went by, they were portrayed more like an actual man. And even later, they were portrayed as a half man, half goat. So people get them confused with the god Pan all the time. Though the distinguishing feature here is that Sartre have a permanent flagging erection. Marcius was very good at music, particularly at Aulos, a double-barreled woodwind. 
In the mythology, it was invented by Athena, though she threw it away because whenever she played it, her cheeks would puff up and she thought it was ugly. Well, I think it's kind of cute. Anyway, she threw it away and cursed whoever picked it up to die a horrible death. And who else picked it up but our blue-pilled buddy? So after that, Marcius challenged Apollo himself to a music battle. Marcius on the Aulos and... Apollo on the liar. Whoever wins can do whatever they want to the loser. Now, Martius was good, but he's not God like he lost. And as a punishment, Apollo decided to flay him, which I think that's just poor sportsmanship. Now, in this particular painting, the Aulos was changed into a panpipe and Apollo's liar was changed to Lyra de Brachio. The figure wearing a crown in the right there is King Midas himself, who is actually not in this story, but in another similar story called the Judgment of Midas, where he acted as a judge, like in America's Got Talent, essentially. Titian just got the two stories mixed up, which was pretty common back then. Masks Still Life 3 by Emil Node. Now, you might think that there's nothing disturbing about this painting. It's just a bunch of mask Node lined up and paint, uh, hence the name Mask Still Life. And you're correct, there's nothing inherently disturbing about this painting. Uh, the artist himself, however, his story is uh, kind of wacky. Emil Nold was one of the earlier people in the Expressionist movement. If you're not familiar with Expressionism, it's basically paint what you feel, not what you see. The most famous Expressionism piece is uh, Edward Munch's The Scream, which we already talked about. Anyway, Emil Nold was from around the same time as Munch. He was born in northern Germany and he was a racist. Not only that, he was a Nazi supporter, but here's the goofy part. Majority of his paintings were made before 1933, which was the year Hitler became chancellor. And what do you know, Hitler absolutely hated modern art. So poor note, despite supporting them, over 1000 pieces of his art were removed from museums. And some of them were even on display at the Degenerate Art Exhibition in 1938. He wasn't allowed to paint at all during this time, not even in private, but he still managed to create hundreds of watercolor paintings in secret, which he named the Unpainted Pictures, Saint Wolfgang and the Devil by Moritz Wanschven. Now, the story behind this painting is super cute, trust me. Okay, here we go. There was a bishop named Wolfgang and one day he decided to build a church. So he climbed the mountain and threw his axe off it. Wherever that axe landed, he's going to build there. When he went to pick up the axe, a wolf popped out of the woods and it was like, hey, I'm gonna build a church. Wanna help me? And the wolf was like, wolf? So then the wolf's owner came, a hunter, and Wolfgang was like, Hey, I'm gonna build a church. Wanna help me? And the hunter was like, Nope, I I'm going to hunting. So Wolfgang was like, Shit! Then he came upon a guy, but not just some guy, a devil named Urien. So Wolfgang asked Urien, Hey, I'm gonna build a church. Uh, wanna help me? And Urien was like, Really? I mean, yeah. All right, you mad lad, I'll help you build the church, but the first soul that walks through the door is mine to diddle my Jimmy with for eternity. Huh. Deal. So Wolfgang and Urien had a gay old time building the church, and it turned out pretty good. Yeah. Say, isn't one soul a bit too pricey? Hey, I'm gonna get that soul one way or another, buddy. Alright, fine. So Wolfgang opened the church's door ready for his first worshipper. And who came running but the wolf and the hunter? The wolf plowed right through the doorway and Urien was like, Okay, that's not fair. To Nolan's Volans, motherfucker. So the wolf's soul was damned for eternity and the hunter couldn't hunt. The place where this happened is now called St. Wolfgang im Salzhammergut in Austria and it is absolutely beautiful. Wolfgang was later canonized as a patron saint of woodcarvers, carpenters and apoplexy. Hey there, quick b-roll here. While I was researching the video, I searched up Saint Wolfgang and the Devil on Google Images and this picture comes up by Michael Packer, which I assumed was the intended subject in the iceberg. And there are various articles saying this is Saint Wolfgang. However, while I was editing, I came across the official museum that this was uh, held at and the entry said it's actually not Saint Wolfgang It's Saint Augustine while being presented with the book of vices by the devil The confusion came to be because Michael Packer also did some altar pieces for Saint Wolfgang But I imagine this is the same situation as Goya's black painting in this case the painting is 
from 15th century. And without first-hand account, it's impossible to tell which figure Michael Packer was trying to portray. I lean more towards St. Augustine though, because the painting doesn't really fit the story of St. Wolfgang, does it? Anyway, back to the video. Moving on to the third tier, we have the hand resist him. Oh, it's another, it's another cursed painting. It's great. Well, this one actually has an artist behind it, William Stoneham, and he gave a detailed meaning behind the painting on his website. Uh, I quote, When I painted the hands resist him in 1972, I used an old photo of myself at age five in a Chicago apartment. The hands are the other lives. The glass door, that thin veil between waking and dreaming. The girl slash doll is the imagined companion or guide through this realm. The curse became a thing because both the gallery owner where this was on display and the critic who wrote about this both died within one year after coming into contact with the painting. After that, John Marley bought it. Uh, he played Jack Walt in The Godfather. He also died, but he was old and his heart wasn't that good. After a while, the painting showed up on eBay and the description said it was cursed, which unless Mr. Stoneham was a goddamn sorcerer and vexed the painting, uh, I, I don't think that statement is accurate. You know what, I'll do you one a solid and give my own theory on these unexplainable death. Uh, people die. After the success of the Hands Resist Him, Stoneham painted four more paintings for the series. The last one only completed last year in 2021. A little more about the artist Stoneham. Uh, he was hired by Lucas Films to work on feature films like Star Wars. He even went on to do uh, concept art for other games like Tomb Raiders, which I think is pretty cool. Man Mocked by Two Women by Francisco Goya. The painting shows two women and one man on the right and the man has his hand on his junk, and at least one of the women is laughing at him. Again, like all Goya's black painting, no one have any idea what it means. Goya could have had a humiliation fetish for all we know. However, an x-ray scan showed an earlier version of the painting where the man is not grabbing his junk and the woman is lying on his knees reading instead, which tied this painting to another one called Men Reading, which possibly showed the same guy, but this time with the boys and reading instead. The Ghost of a Flea by William Blake, this painting was commissioned by Blake's friend, John Varley. He was very into spirits and ghost stuff, but he was pissed off because he couldn't see them. So he naturally gravitated towards Blake, who claimed to have visions every day since he was a child. The two of them would hang out late at night at Varley's house and perform occultic rituals to summon whatever they want. Dead people, fictional people, doesn't matter. And when they eventually appeared, Blake would sketch them out. The flea came to Blake in 1819 during their little pajama party. When he painted, he said he was often joined by invisible spectators, angels, Moses even, and of course, the flea. The flea would tell Blake how he wanted to be portrayed, which can be summarized to, I want to be ripped as hell. If you hear this and thought, oh, this Blake fellow is kind of goofy, don't feel bad because people back then thought so too. Francis Bacon, there are a bunch of his paintings in this iceberg, but I think all his works are equally, you know, yeah. Let's start with his most sensational painting, Three Studies for Figures at the Base of a Crucifixion. This was the painting that Bacon deemed his first mature painting. Anything before this he regarded as irrelevant. Bacon said he modeled the three figures after the Fury sisters in the Greek tragedy Orestia. The Furies are female deities of vengeance and in Orestia, they hunt down a guy named Orestes for killing his mother. Of course the anthropomorphic blob in Bacon's painting looked nothing like the Furies, but remember, Expressionism is all about how it feels. These blobs may also be from Picasso's On the Beach painting. Originally, he planned to paint a large crucifix for these paintings to go under, but uh, he didn't come around to it. The next one is one of the most well-known works by Francis Bacon, the study after Velazquez's portrait of Pope Innocent X. The original portrait was done by Diego Velazquez in 1650, said to be the most realistic Pope portrait ever made. Allegedly, when the Pope saw the finished painting, he yelled, It's too true! It's too true. It says me when I saw my passport photo. In an interview, Bacon said that he had nothing against the Pope. He just wanted to paint some dude in a purple clothing, and he never intended to put any meaning behind it. The face of the Pope is directly influenced by this scene from a silent film called 
the battleship Pachomkin. After he finished the painting, he deliberately avoided looking at the original Velasquez portrait in real life, despite being in Rome for two months one time. He said he feared seeing the reality of Velasquez's after his tampering with it, but he eventually saw it much later in life. Painting 1946. Believe it or not, this one was totally made by accident. Initially, Bacon intended to paint a chimpanzee in a long grass with the bird of prey landing in the field, but then the bird's form overlapped another form already on the canvas, so he thought, well, too late now, and painted this picture. It was completely unconscious, might as well be sleepwalking and painted it. Damien Hirst even took an inspiration from this painting and created an installation called School, the Archaeology of Lost Desires, Comprehending Infinity and the Search for Knowledge after painting 1946. Now, let's be honest, this Damien Hirst fella, he, he might not be the greatest artist in the world, but He's fantastic at coming up with research paper names for made-up psychological studies. Archaeology of Lost Desires? A comprehending Infinity? Uh, I, mean, I mean, I don't mean to, I don't mean to be rude, but that, that's some MK Ultra bullshit. The last one here is Figure with Meat. This one is a combination of previous two paintings. The butchered meat in the back and the Pope in the front. Some people think the meat is an allegory for the crucifix, which in this context kind of makes sense. But there's another similar painting by Rembrandt from 1655 called The Slaughtered Ox. And someone seriously thought this was Jesus Christ himself. Well, don't get me wrong, I love Jesus Christ, but you can't just say anything that went like this is the crucifixion, you know? Let's see. Okay, here we go. Oh gosh, look! It's Jesus Christ! Big Electric Chair by Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol is best known for his silkscreen portraits of famous celebrities, but this time he silkscreened an electric chair instead. Ooh, <laughs> you disturbed yet? Girl with Death Mask by Frida Kahlo. This was painted when Kahlo was mourning her miscarried baby. The skull mask is a common decoration for the Mexican holiday, Dia de los Muertos, or Day of the Dead. The tiger mask is a talisman to ward off evil. The marigold flower is also known as Flower of the Dead and it's used to attract souls from the cemeteries to their offerings at home. The brighter and the stronger the scent, the better. The Dead Mother by Edward Munch. Munch's mother died when he was just five years old and nine years later, his favorite sister, Johann Sophie, would follow both of tuberculosis. Munch's sister's death is portrayed in another painting, The Sick Child. Here's one glaring observation. The girl here is striking the same pose as in the Scream painting, which was painted before, so uh, take that as you will. The painting is said to be um, haunted. Mm. Uh, you know, whatever. The girl's eyes moved, the uh, bed sheets rustling sounds and Sometimes a girl would disappear altogether. I, I mean, if I were you, I'd be pretty damn pissed off, no? You, you know, well, I paid for the full painting and what, I don't even get the full painting half the times? Come on. Lucifer by Franz von Stock. Franz von Stock was a German painter best known for his ancient mythological figures paintings, uh, most of which are very risque. But he had kind of a dark phase where he painted a bunch of scenes from Dante's Inferno and other dark stuff. Stuck was part of a movement called symbolism where they aimed to portray artists' thoughts and feelings rather than capturing nature and reality, which was pretty hip and cool back then with uh, impressionism and realism and all those. Symbolism was very theme-based. The most popular themes are death, sickness, sin and passion. Also, earlier in the video, we already talked about another symbolist painting. Can you guess who it is? That's right, it's Arnold Bucklin. Symbolism also paved way for expressionism. Edward Munch, for example, made some symbolist paintings early on. Moving on to the fourth tier, Man Proposes, God Disposes by Edwin Landseer. This painting was made as a reaction to Franklin's Lost Expedition. For context, the Franklin's Lost Expedition was led by Sir John Franklin to find a sea route from Europe to Asia through the North Pole. Uh, they did not come back. I can't go into much depth because this video would be like three hours long. This I, I'm in the middle of filming this video, so I have no idea how long this video is right now. It's, it might have reached three hours already, who, who knows. But Wendigoon already made a very thorough video on it. In fact, uh, you've probably seen it already. The name man proposes, God disposes came from the Latin phrase, 
Homo propenit said Deus disponit from a 15th century book called The Imitation of Christ. The most horrible story about this painting is that when it was finished, it was displayed at the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition. And some dumbass invited John Franklin's wife. <laughs> now, now, just close your eyes and imagine being her for a second, okay? Uh, your husband disappeared, vanished into thin air for 20 years. And not a single finger found. Yeah, you're starting to gradually come to term with it. You know, grief, if you've ever been through, it takes time. It, this thing happens slowly. You got to sit down and reconcile with yourself the event that you just went through. The first few years, I uh, can't even imagine. It's probably horrible. Uh, you wake up and the first thought in your mind is, have they found my husband yet? No. No, okay. And then time went by, uh, and the first thought in your head right after you wake up might not be your husband anymore. It might have been, you know, uh, I think I'm going to have Egg Benedict for breakfast today. And even later, uh, you'll find days that you don't even think about your husband at all. Uh, but you still hold out for hope. You know, you funded multiple exhibitions to find out the the true fate, what happened to him. And then you went into an art gallery, and there he is, getting mauled by fucking two polar bears. All right, let's see if there are any more interesting stories about this painting. Uh, it's currently on display at the University of London. Oh, that's cool. Jesus Christ, it's not a goddamn cursed painting. Apparently, if you look at this painting before an examination, you fail to the point that they have to cover this painting up during exam season. So uh, there you go. Good luck. Sam Wolf Connolly. He, uh, he art and art creepy. He made this poster for Silent Hill. That's pretty cool. If you ever watch Over the Garden Wall, he also made the album cover for the soundtrack. The Rain Woman by Svetlana Telitz. It's another cock-sucking curse painting! This one, when you hang it up on your wall, uh, it makes you not sleep. Great, it cures narcolepsy. Woohoo. All jokes aside by itself, I think it's a pretty painting. Um, one of the better looking haunted paintings for sure. Ivan the Terrible and his son Ivan by Ilya Ryepin. The terrible part in Ivan the Terrible is actually a mistranslation. His name is more accurately translated to the formidable or the fearsome. Uh, still a pretty terrible guy though, but then again, which 16th century European leaders aren't? Ivan became the first Tsar of all Russia in 1549, which back then was still a small country with not much going for it. Early on, Ivan was not that bad of a ruler. I mean, yeah, he liked torturing people and animals when he was a boy, but back then there wasn't a life leak around, so secondhand experience was pretty rare. And he built a pretty nice looking cathedral. He also made better legal codes and local governments and stuff like that. One of the reforms was limiting the power of noble families called the boyars and giving back to the people who served the Tsars, regardless of their lineage. Keep in mind that the boyars and Ivan did not get along well at all, not since that time they killed his mother, allegedly, when he was eight years old. He fought the Khanat of Kazan, the leftovers from Genghis Khan's Golden Horde, and won got a river from that war, secured a trade route. Then he thought to himself, hmm, now I got a river. What's, what's better than a river? The sea, yes, the sea. Who has the sea? Livonia? Okay, let's go to war with them. So the Livonian war started. At first they were doing pretty good, but then Poland butt in and things got worse. Ivan's best field commander got into bed with them, figuratively. Or literally too, who knows. Ivan was so distraught by this that he resigned from the throne. <laughs> he didn't want to be Tsar anymore. But this was in the smack dab of the Livonian War. And in war you kind of need an authority figure that people looked up to so as to not to ensue chaos. So the boyars went to beg Ivan to come back to the throne even though they hated him. Little did they know, they just activated Ivan's trap card. He said, okay, I'll be the Tsar again, but... I have absolute rule and no one can say no if I happen to want to commit some atrocities. W would you actually do it though? I, I don't know, maybe. He did. He created the Oprishnika, a secret police force that did very unpoliceman like things like public executions and raping. The worst of these happened during the massacre of Novgorod, where over 2,000 people died. They would tie the citizens to sleighs and slide them into a frozen lake just because Ivan thought there was some treasonous conspiracy going on there. 
I'm, I'm just going to take a wild stance here. There probably wasn't. The guy was just a lunatic at this point. And towards the tail end of over 20 years long Livonian War, Ivan, with all the madness in his skull, saw his son's pregnant wife wearing a revealing outfit. He beat her until she miscarried, and his son Ivan Ivanovich came begging for him to stop. In a fit of rage, he hit his son upside the head with his scepter. He immediately collapsed, uh, took his son in his arm, kissed his head, tried to stop the bleeding, and said, May I be damned. I've killed my son. I've killed my son. The painting is easily one of the most famous and controversial in Russia. It has been vandalized twice. Once in 1913, when it was slashed three times by an iconoclast, the curator of the gallery this painting belonged to, when learned of the vandalism, threw himself under the train. How's that for a cursed painting? Another time in 2018, when the drunk dude broke the glass case with a metal bar, uh, piercing the painting in the process. When Ryapin was painting this picture, he said, I painted in tears. I was tortured. I tormented myself. I corrected again and again what I had painted. I hid it in a sickly disappointment no longer believing in my strength. I erased what I had painted, I had already erased, and I was attacking the canvas again. Every minute was terrible to me. I was disappointed with this painting. I hid it, and she made the same impression on my friends, but something pushed me towards her, and again, I was working on it. You know, I don't like to give my subjective opinion on a painting. I like giving you, you know, necessary information for you to shape your own thoughts, so, you know, the paintings can be yours. But I just want to say, no painting ever made me emotional quite like this one. I mean, look at those eyes. Even though he was such a jerk, you can't help but feel bad for the guy. I'm sorry, let's move on. The Dog by Francisco Goya. Again, black painting, Goya, that's all I had to say. The Dog may be from a painting by Pierre Bernard's red checkered tablecloth. Looks like the same dog. The Great Red Dragon and the Beast from the Sea by William Blake. The Great Red Dragon came from a Bible verse in the book of Revelations. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. This was just one of the four paintings of the Great Red Dragon by William Blake, who was commissioned to make over 100 illustrations for the Bible at the time. Now, I've watched Hannibal before, love that show, and there was a serial killer who thought he was the Red Dragon, and he ate the painting. So whenever I see this painting, I just want to eat it. The 3rd of May, 1808 by Francisco Goya. Just a quick recap of the situation, you know, prior to this event. Now, you know Napoleon, and during this time, he was pretty much the ruler of Europe. He and Spain just invaded and occupied Portugal, as well as, you know, occupying Spain along the way. They seemed pretty buddy-buddy at the time, but this was just for appearances sake, because who the hell wants to go to war with Napoleon? In reality, Spain didn't like Napoleon very much, and Napoleon didn't like Spain very much either. So he abdicated their emperor and installed his own brother as an emperor. The upper echelon of the Spanish government didn't mind, but the people, however, don't care much for being a puppet state. So like gamers, they rise up in the 2nd of May uprising. The uprising was crushed pretty quickly by the French Imperial Guards, and the next day they rounded up all the citizens of Madrid and, you know, reprisals. These events marked the beginning of a five-year-long war called the Peninsula War, and in the end, the Spanish did win with the help of the British. The painting is blunt and brutal, pretty unheard of during the time this was painted, which was the Romantic period. Think uh, Raft of Medusa, a horrifying story, but portrayed gloriously. Goya took the composition from another drawing, the assassination of five monks from Valencia by Miguel Gambarino. Also on the right hand of the central figure, you can see a wound on it. That's a Jesus Christ reference. This painting went on to inspire other pieces of art, such as the execution of Emperor Maximilian by Edouard Manet, uh, Massacre in Courier, and also Guernica by Picasso. And of course, the greatest one of them all, Redo of Healer. Moving on to tier 5, and the first one up we have The Smiling Spider by Olion Redon. Redon was one of the symbolist painters mentioned earlier. Early in his career he worked exclusively with charcoal and lithographs, which is when you paint on a stone and then print it on paper. All of them are in black and white, hence people refer to his works from this period as Norse. The Smiling Spider is one of those Noir lithographs. He also made The Crying Spider in charcoal. However, in the 1890s he started using oil and pastel, which 
quickly became his favorite medium. And after 1900, he stopped producing noir altogether. Also, during this time, he found out about Japanese art. So, you know, he went full on, can we get much higher mode? You know, painting Buddha and Japanese vases and Attack on Titan, which segue perfectly into this next painting, The Cyclops, also by Radon. The painting may depict a Greek myth of Polyphemus and his crush Galatia. Polyphemus was a giant cyclops son of Poseidon, and Galatia was a Nereid, uh, one of the 50 nymph daughters of the Old Man of the Sea. I won't go into much detail. Polyphemus had a crush big time on Galatia, but Galatia loved another man. Uh, Asis was his name. One day, Polyphemus saw Galatia and Asis acting all lovey-dovey by the sea, so he tore a huge chunk of boulder out of Mount Etna and hurled it at Asis, crushing him to death. Here's what I have to say. Hey, Polyphemus, stop having fun! Ahasuerus at the End of the World by Adolf Hermi Hirsch. Apparently, it's a common name. The painting depicts a legendary figure called the Wandering Jew, commonly named Ahasuerus, who laughed at Jesus Christ during his crucifixion, so he was cursed to roam the earth until his second coming. Which is ironic, seeing how this painting shows him at the end of the world, meaning the second coming never came. There's also a king named Ahasuerus in the Bible, who is a fictional version of King Xerxes I of the Persian Empire. But that one has absolutely nothing to do with this painting, they just have the same name. Well, I just want to talk about it. The Barricade, Rue de la Motellerie, or Remembrance of Civil War by Jean-Louis Ernest Maisonnier. The event in this painting is called the June Days Uprising, which happened right after the French Revolution. Uh, the third French Revolution. Basically, after the 1814 mini French Revolution, the depression kicked in. So the government founded something called the National Workshop aimed to find jobs for the unemployed in Paris. And if you sign up and they couldn't find you a job, you also be compensated with a slightly lower wages. Sounds amazing, right? Well, maybe it's a little too good. Over 100,000 people flocked to the workshop, some even from different countries. And there was no way they would find jobs that quickly, not in that economy. Uh, speaking of jobs, most of them are super menial, like construction or draining swamps. The wage was 2 francs per day if you did the job, and 1.5 francs per day if they couldn't find you a job. <laughs> I would just, I would sleep all day. That's 75% of the wage for doing literally nothing. And uh, Women got 12 sous, you know, 19th century. Regardless, these wages are still not enough to keep food on the table. The real kicker here was that those tiny wages came from an increased tax on landowners. Rich people and taxes are like Tom and Jerry. You can put them in the same room, and after a lot of screaming, one will always avoid another. So a few months in, the government said, okay, uh, this is not working out at all. We're calling it quit. And the starving people went, hey, well, what are we supposed to do now? Or you can join the military. Then they started shooting each other. Now keep in mind there was an influx of over 100,000 starving people. And the government can already smell an insurrection from this. So they mobilized their military ages ago. The rebels, despite tearing out bricks from the sidewalk and building hundreds of barricades, hence the name of the painting, did not stand a chance and the uprising was crushed almost immediately. Both sides suffered heavy casualty, even the Archbishop of Paris at the time got caught in the crossfire. In Ictu Oculi, or In the Blink of an Eye by Juan de Valdez Lille. This is one part of a pair of painting by Lille, another one being Finis Gloriae Mundi, uh, thus passes the glory of the world. As you may pick up from the motif and the names, these two pieces were meant to be a memento mori, a reminder of death. It was commissioned by a hospital and was hung there, which is kind of messed up. Imagine you being the patient and you know you go in there and went, Hey doc, I'm not feeling well today. Uh, I might have some kind of a flu. Oh, whoa there, that's a real grim painting you got there. Uh, what's it represent? You had a couple weeks probably. <laughs> Let's Suicide by Edward Manet. The painting shows a guy with a gun in his hand, and the painting is called Le Suicide, the dots connect. Actually, not much is really known about this painting because of how little it's been studied, and people have a hard time pinpointing when exactly Manet painted this and where he was, like artistically speaking. The painting stands out among Manet's repertoire, who usually painted slice of life stuff, 
uh, with a few exceptions, but nothing quite as jarring as this. Gagoze is a yokai said to haunt the Gangoji, a temple in Nara prefecture. And Gagoze and Gangoji is written the same way. There's a story of him. Well, it's not much of a story. Basically, he killed people, and then he was defeated by a child blessed with the power of a lightning god. Uh, it sounds like a very generic premise to a very bland shonen manga. Gallo Gade Lard by Ken Curie. Ken Curie is a Scottish artist who went to Glasgow School of Arts, and Gallo Gade is a neighborhood in Glasgow. Gallo Gade Lard is said to be Ken Curie's self-portrait, but Curie himself hates having any analysis done on his painting. Even destroyed one when it was figured out. Curie also loves Francis Bacon, and looking at his painting, uh, yeah, I think his other works are more disturbing to be honest. Like Three Oncologists, for example, that's a pretty good painting. Spanish dancer at the Moulin Rouge by Giovanni Boldini. The Moulin Rouge is the most famous cabaret in the world. It's been open for like 130 years now. This is the place where the can-can dance became a big deal. And back then this dance was considered pretty, uh, you know? Safe to say Boldini himself loved a little late night entertainment. What's disturbing about this painting? Nothing. Muzane, this isn't a name of a particular painting, it's a genre. Muzane are ukiyo-e or woodblock prints that depict violent scenes from histories or kabuki plays. These are all painted during late Edo period and early Meiji era. The most famous sets of Muzane are Emeiri Jashuku, Azuma Nishiki Ukiyo Kodan, and Kaidai Kyakusenso. All of them are mainly painted by a guy named Tsukioka Yoshitoshi, the last great master of ukiyo-e. He studied under another great master named Utakawa Kuniyoshi, Emeiri Joshuku, is the oldest one and it was a collab between him and another Utakawa pupil, Ochiya Yoshiku. The name of this set translates to 28 murders with verse. The most famous painting from this set is probably this one, Inada Kyuzo Shinsuke. Tsukioka mixed in animal glue with a red paint to give the blood that shiny sheen. I want to tell you the exact story behind this painting, but my Japanese kind of suck. Uh, I, I can't even read manga in Japanese, let alone a 19th century poem. Every article online I found about this painting have like one sentence description of what's going on here, despite it having, you know, an entire poem written next to it. And none of them ever cite the source of the story. All I gathered from the poem is that it says cut a lot. And this was some kind of a revenge for a child. The Corpses of the DeWitt Brothers by Jan de Bon. Cornelius and Johan de Witt were a pretty big deal in Dutch Golden Age politics. Johan was the grand pensionary of Holland, uh, think of him as the president, and Cornelius was a mayor. They did pretty well for themselves early on, winning the Second Anglo-Dutch War. The opponent of the DeWitt Brothers was the House of Orange Nassau, its leader? William the Orange, soon to be King of England, nicknamed King Billy, the origin of Billy Boys, if you ever watched uh, Peaky Blinders. Anyway, shit hits the fan for the DeWitt brothers in 1672, dubbed the Disaster Year. This was when France and England decided to join forces to invade Dutch. Uh, the Dutch lose, of course, and the Oranges had the perfect excuse to seize the power. William the Orange was appointed a stadtholder, a duke. And only a month and a half in, Cornelius was accused of treason and was heavily tortured for confession. He didn't confess because he didn't do it. So he was sentenced to exile instead. Awaiting his banishment in jail, Johan went to visit his brother to help him get ready for the journey. He was right next door anyway. Immediately they were attacked by Orange's mob, shot dead. Then their body mutilated and left hanging on display. Not only that, the Orangists also consume their flesh in a rabbit frenzy, uh, roasted liver to be specific. And these guys weren't even starving in the middle of an ocean. What's the deal with that? Also, if the king is represented by his subject, this is already not painting a very good picture. Their various body parts were cut off and sold. That includes their cock. Their tongue and fingers are still here today. Want to see them? Here you go. Now, is it just me or did these oranges went a little too far? What's funny is Yanaban was the one who did these portraits for the DeWitt brothers in their glory days. So I'm going to have to give him five stars for his commitment to his clients. The Fall of the Damned by Peter Paul Rubens. This is a painting of a scene from the Book of Revelations when Archangel Michael defeated Satan and cast him down to earth with all his rebel angels. The story itself is like two verses long and Rubens were able to make this epic painting out of that. 
it's insane to me. Next up is tier six, starting with Corpus Hypercubus by Salvador Dali. This is from Dali's later period where he teetered away from surrealism because he was so obsessed with uh, atomic bombs. So things got very sci-fi. The painting shows Jesus crucified on a tesseract. The lady in the bottom left is supposed to be Mary Magdalene, one of Jesus' follower, modeled by his wife, Gayla. Also, he painted his and her faces on Jesus' knees, although it's a little hard to see. Miss Muriel Belcher by Francis Bacon. Muriel Belcher was the owner of a private drinking club called The Colony Room, founded by Bacon himself. She was known for her rudeness, and her favorite word was... Cut! Deterioration of Mind Over Matter by Otto Rapp. Honestly, what's more disturbing than uh, the painting itself is his website design. Well, painting is his profession, but graphic design is his passion, I guess. Jack the Ripper's Bedroom by Walter Sickert. This man was obsessed with Jack the Ripper, uh, so much so that someone actually thought he was uh, Jack the Ripper. The painting claimed this was Jack the Ripper's bedroom, but in reality, it, it's just his room. The landlady told him that Jack the Ripper used to stay there, which uh, I'm just going to throw that out there so there's no confusion. 100% lie. The painting by Sickert I found to be much creepier is... What shall we do for the rent, depicting the Camden Town murders? It's pretty much almost exactly the same as one of the Jack the Ripper's cases, but this one actually got a little courtroom drama action on the side. The suspect was acquitted and the murder is still unsolved. Tier 7, first one up, Wan Gina. Wan Gina are rainmaker spirits from Australian Aboriginal mythology. These guys can be found on rock arts throughout Kimberley, Australia. Some of them are approximated to be as old as 4,000 years old. However, I can't for the life of me find out uh, who the original artist was. Uh, if anybody got a name, uh, feel free to comment it down below. The Cave of Hands is located in Santa Cruz, Argentina. Uh, oldest one, 7,000 years old. What they did was they basically they put the left hand on the walls and used uh, spray paint to make stencils out of them. True story. Some scholars thought this was purely for decorations, uh, horrible taste, while others argue in favor of hunting rituals. As you can see, the hands are not always perfect, uh, especially this one right here. Now, a normal person would see this and goes, oh, that's a Rhea's foot, but I think I know the truth. It's like Breaking Bad, you know? Everybody is saying it's a horrible show. Well, I think it's the best show. You say it's Rhea's feet, I say aliens. Execution Without Judgment Under the Moorish Kings of Granada by Henri Renault. For context, the Moors were the Muslim people who lived in this area in the Middle Age, and Granada was the last Muslim state in Western Europe. It eventually failed when the Reconquista happened. Basically, Christians conquered every Iberia territory ruled by Muslim. The backdrop of this painting was borrowed from Alhambra, a Granada fortress where Renault stayed for a while. The painting itself shows a Moorish guy killing another Moor. Some sources said this is based on a local legend, but I couldn't pinpoint exactly which legend they were referring to. However, I connected some dots. Henri Renault had a good friend named Georges Clorong who traveled with him on multiple occasions. And Clorong also painted this picture called The Massacre of the Abensarages, which was based on a French novella called The Adventure of the Last Abensarage, which may have been based on a local folklore which took place in the Alhambra. You following me? So here's how the story goes. The Abensarages were a prominent Muslim family in Granada. One day, an Abensaraj guy fell in love with a girl. Accounts varied widely whether she was a Christian from a noble Spanish family or a sultan's favorite concubine. Or worse yet, the love story was invented by a rival family. Anyway, the king wasn't very happy with this, so he ordered the entire family to be slaughtered and their heads were thrown into a fountain, which still stained red to this day. Nice world building. Also, it just so happened that the room they were mowed down in was one of the most beautiful courts in Alhambra. Today, it's called the Hall of Abensaraj. The Broken Column by Frida Kahlo. Frida Kahlo went through a major bus accident when she was 18 that left her with a lifelong pain. She was impaled by an iron handrail in her pelvic bone, damaging her hips and spine. After the accident, she was confined in her bed for three months. This is where she started painting. She had a specially made easel and a mirror so she could paint herself. The broken column, however, was painted much later in her life when her health rapidly deteriorated, coupled with a failed spinal surgery. Also, pay attention to the numerous nails on her body. That's a Jesus Christ reference. I and the Village by Mark Chagall. 
This is a narrative portrait showing Chakal's childhood memory of his village, Vitebsk, in Russia. If you look closely, you can see these things that a village boy might see. A milkmaid, a town's church, and some balls that he used to play with. It's almost like he painted a diary, and it tells a very dreamy, nostalgic story. Now, I don't know why this is in this list, but I'm gonna use my own deduction skills. Uh, the creator may have seen uh, the scythe carrier and thought, death. Unbeknownst to a lot of people, however, the scythe is not only used by the Grim Reaper to harvest souls. It was initially created for agriculture. Hide and Seek by Pavel Chilichev. This painting is based on a tree that Chilichev saw once while he was traveling, and apparently he was so obsessed with it because he made several drawings of this particular tree. And every time he drew it, he'd add more elements to the drawing. You know, children playing, giving the tree feet and faces and whatnot. Finally, he painted Hide and Seek, which took him exactly two years. The Examination by Wayne Barlow. Wayne Barlow is a concept artist for films like Harry Potter, Avatar, and Hellboy. The Examination was inspired by Flemish paintings of doctors studying bodies. Oh, they cut his penis off. The Reaper by Joan Miro. This was another painting related to the Spanish Civil War. The painting depicted a Catalan peasant wearing their signature Baratina hat on one hand holding out a clenched fist salute, and another hand holding a sickle. Well, I don't own a sickle. Now, I know what you're thinking. Whoa, whoa there, that's some red commie propaganda right there. But no, unbeknownst to a lot of people, a sickle was initially created for agriculture. Miro was inspired by a Catalan song, El Segador, meaning the Reaper, which is now their national anthem as well. The painting was unveiled at the 1937 Paris World Fair, same place as Guernica. However, after the exhibition, the painting was lost during transit and only black and white photos of it remained. Which is a shame because Miro liked to use some vibrant colors in his painting. But Miro himself wasn't too distraught because of how overshadowed the painting was by Guernica. Oh, poor guy. Finally, we're moving on to the last here. Lagrimas de Sangre by Oswaldo Goyasemin. This painting was done in response to 1973 Chilean coup. To summarize quickly, during that time, there was a Chilean president named Salvador Allende, who was the first Marxist elected president in Latin America to the south. But if you didn't know, the America to the north, led by a dude named Richard Nixon, didn't care much for these little red riding dudes. Not while Cuba and Fidel Castro things are going on, so the CIA tried to instigate a coup. In the process, destroying Chile's economy, like financing labor union strikes, serving hot dishes of propaganda and smear campaigns. But the real tragedy struck when one military general named Augusto Pinochet decided to overthrow the government. Was he backed by the US? Who knows, he probably was. The battle was intense. Allende stood his ground in the presidential palace and later committed suicide. Pinochet's regime was the same as your usual dictatorship, uh, torture. And you know, it's crazy how almost no dictatorship in history ever tried, you know, being nice. Anyway, Pinochet was a big star. The US supported him, the UK supported him, the Chilean economy even improved and stabilized. Yeah, it's almost as if there's uh, nobody there to cripple it. Years later, when he was a grumpy old dude, people tried to put him on trial for the numerous human rights violation he committed, but he dropped dead before they could do anything. Tatsuma Yuko is a Japanese artist. If you've been deep digging the internet, you may have come across this painting, commonly associated with a creepy pasta, Tomino no Jikoku. Pretty spooky. However, the real story behind this painting and other Tatsushima's art is much, much more disturbing. The real name of this painting is Atashi wa mou yomeni wa ikimasen, which translates to, I can no longer be a bride. A common phrase in Japan used when a girl did something indecent that would deem them unsuitable for marriage. Most of the time it's used jokingly like, oh, haha, I can no longer marry because I just spent $50,000 trying to roll for a Nemo in Fate. It, whatever. But Tatsuma's art doesn't use this jokingly. Tatsuma herself has experienced stalking as well as rape, and a lot of her works are created in rebellion of these sex crimes. In an interview, she said that most of her works are self-portraits. Another theme present in her works is the atomic bomb because she grew up around the survivors. When she was in elementary school, her teacher from Hiroshima would show the class a picture book of the survivors of the bomb. Sometimes she would get scared and run away, but she'd feel guilty later and look them up on her own in the school library. A for effort. Human Laundry by Doris Zinkaysen. Zinkaysen was commissioned by Red Cross and St. John War Organization to record their missions during World War II. The event depicted in this painting happened on 15th of April, 1945, 
when the British forces liberated the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. Inside, there were over 10,000 unburied bodies and over 60,000 sick and starving people. Zinkaysen arrived a few days later and saw some 60 tables set up, stationed by German doctors and nurses to wash and delouse everybody before admitting them to the Red Cross hospital. They nicknamed this the human laundry. The last three subjects on this list I'll gloss over very quickly. Joel Peter Witkin isn't even a painter, he's a photographer from Albuquerque. And Yang Xiaopin is a Chinese artist whose work is relatively tame compared to what we covered today. But hold on, I have one last painting to show you. Now, this one might make you jump on your chairs like Mammy Two Shoes from Tom and Jerry when she saw the orange rat. See if you can guess what it is. Here we go. Three, two, one. It's this panel from Chainsaw Man by Fujimoto Tatsuki. Now, I'm only half joking about this, but just, just let me talk about it. If you've never read Chainsaw Man or have never heard of it, a uh, minor spoiler ahead. This scene shows the darkness devil, which is uh, the embodiment of the fear of darkness. The astronauts praying with their guts spilling out just encapsulates the message perfectly in so many ways. I can make an entire video talking about this panel alone. You can see Beksinski's influence on the design as well because Fujimoto studied Western painting in college and his visual storytelling, it's completely on the next level. If you're not familiar with his works or manga in general, I highly, highly recommend you giving Fire Punch or Chainsaw Man a read. Both are insane series. He also have a couple of short stories. Goodbye, Eri is his latest one. And Look Back, both are just... Oh, it, they're so good. Listen, I've been working on this video for like a month and a half, okay? Uh, just let me have my moment here. And manga artists are artists too, you know? So there it is. I hope I provided you with enough information for you to appreciate these paintings more because it certainly did for me. Uh, I was really immersed in the events and backstory that led to the creation of these paintings, especially modern art, which I never really cared much for, to be honest. I thought it was nonsense. Turns out they're not nonsense, and most of them have amazing stories behind them. Some of them are so powerful they can shape the thought of the entire world. Finally, the most important message I want to leave you with. Before giving a perfunctory far-fetched meaning to any tangential object, ask yourself this. Can it farm? That's it for me, folks. Please like if you haven't, comment if you haven't, subscribe if you haven't. Thank you for watching, and have a good, uh, thing. Hell, this one is part. My cat just did like 24 spins. This is going like Beyblade. That's crazy. Oh my god, she's gonna start a typhoon in my. Oh my god, she's still going.